uh, Monday, the, the, the train uh, from Sydney to Melbourne ended up being 15 minutes late. Um, I get onto the train and then I learned that they were actually talking about terminating the train at Mossvale. It wouldn't continue. Uh, however, the decision had been made it wouldn't go through because what had happened, a freight train had been derailed at Exeter, which was just a little further south along the tracks. So the tracks were clear that the train would go through. So we're leaving Mossvale Station 50 minutes late. I text you to tell you, you know, it should be in around 8.30, a, a little bit earlier. Um, okay, the next morning we arrive exactly 50 minutes uh, later than the regular ETA, but you, you call me 10 minutes before the train actually stops and say, where are you? And I say, we're just pulling into the station. And you go, oh my God, I, I haven't left the house yet. And Michelle said, you'd be much later, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm leaving now. All right, so I get off the train and go to the bathroom when you call again, 10 minutes later, and the fan belt has broken in your car. Um, your idea is to go back to the house, get the other car, you tell me to get on a train to Greensboro, I go, okay. So I just walk out of the bathroom, not really having a clue what time it was or when the next train was. As I'm walking past all the notice boards, it says Greensboro 840, platform 9, so I know where I have to go. I get my ticket, I get onto the platform, you call, and I say, well, the next train to Greensboro is arriving in one minute. End of conversation, I turn around and the train is already pulling into the station, and I'm looking at which carriage I will get into, um, I could have gone to the right, it would have been the closest door, um, I look at how many people are getting on and off, that kind of thing, I look at the left, I decide to go to the left and get into the carriage at the left, left people, blah, blah, blah. I sit down in my seat and um, behind me are two youths that get on and sit opposite the other side of the aisle to me. And um, anyway, we, we start our trip and you know, there's about 14 or more stations that we have to call into, you know, at least a half hour trip. And the two kids beside me begin this conversation that I can't help but hear because they're speaking in a normal voice, not trying to conceal anything. Um, the, the quieter one who was leading the conversation with the other guy who was um, uh, louder, full of insult, uh, the, the leader of the two, if you like, one with all the answers and, and uh, know, very, mu very much the show part of things. The quieter one start talking about um, what it would be like to wear the flesh as a coat of a person. He, he was talking about skinning a human being and what it would be like or what you'd have to do in order to be able to wear that skin and the covering. Now, the, the conversation is beginning in this vein and I'm checking within myself. Am I really hearing what I'm hearing? <laughs> so I um, tune in to, to listen very carefully. And they have, they begin this conversation where the other guy is saying, well, you'd have to cut the, the arms out of it so that you could, you know, get like, like arm holes in a coat. And, and then he, the, 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 the other guy, the fatter guy, the, the fatness guy, started to say, you know, would I wear the foreskin over my, well, he used the word cock. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, this is a conversation you would hear in hell between demons. It has to be. So the other fellow starts talking about, oh, no, I'd be circumcised, no foreskin, this, this kind of thing. And then the conversation, the, the, the fatter guy starts to say, man, I'm beginning to have the most macabre thoughts you can possibly imagine. And then he starts talking about in the event of him having frostbite, he would have to go to the zoo to find a particular wolf. He, he names the name of wolf. I can't remember what, what kind of wolf it was. I thought it started with an A. He would have to find this particular wolf, skin it, uh, 
in order to put the, the wolf skin over himself. He described how he would be standing there, stripped down to his underwear, and he'd be doing it in the early hours of the morning, didn't care if anybody saw him there, and used a few expedients to, you know, like tell anybody who, who might mind what he was doing to, like, get asked. Um, and then he started to think, well, well I, I could end up being mauled, mind you, by the rest of the pack, and started to describe what the headlines might be like if, um, as they find his body mauled to death by wolves and, and the remains that they might find, whatever, and he described what it was that he, was, he would be wearing, and, and which is what he was wearing at the time, um, finding a black security guard's cap and this, this black T-shirt over a, a white long sleeve undergarment, jeans, and uh, describing what might be left of this body, five foot 11, uh, uh, big size. Uh, uh, anyway, and on the aviator sunglasses, yes, he was wearing aviator sunglasses at the time. And um, anyway, what was going through my head was, am I really hearing what I'm hearing? And my thought was to, to go to these guys and say, why are you talking this way? What could possibly possess your minds that you'd want to have the conversation that you're having. Anyway, that was going through my mind. And then the skinny one says to the, the, the fat fellow, he says, mate, uh, every day I pick up the, the newspaper and he says, I'm afraid for what I would read because I, I, I have this fear that I would read something gnarly about you or your brother. You know, and it wouldn't be good. And then the, they start to refer to an event that must have happened around Melbourne a, a couple of years ago that was reported in the newspaper. Apparently an entire street of um, uh, residents had their tyres slashed. Uh, for some reason, 400 comes to mind. Uh, tyres being slashed in the street. And uh, it turned out to be the brother of this this fat fellow, and the the fat dude says, "Well, you know, that's my idiot brother." He said, uh, it, "It wasn't me." He says, "For a start, I wouldn't have done it in my street. Would not have done it in my suburb. Even I'd have done it right away. You know, perhaps perhaps this area of town, whatever." And then he threw in. He said, "Actually." I would go to Bendigo, and of course Bendigo is just 15 minutes up the road from where I'm staying at, at Dom's place, and I would slash not one, but I would slash two tyres, and that would of course put a strain on the uh, Royal Automobile Club here, it would be called that because people only have one spare, they don't have two, but just think of what havoc that would cause, you know, the uh, automobile people and the inconvenience, of course. They, that currently, what happened two years ago is that, that you know, as people were finding the tire slashed in the street, they would go out and, and, and change the, to their spare tires, where the group formed, that as they finished one, they would go down the street to help each other out, so that they'd get it through, get through, you know, this inconvenience so much faster. Any, anyway, I was, by this time, really checking my sanity. Am I really hearing this conversation? And Bendigo, they're talking about Bendigo, he slashed tires in Bendigo, just up the road from me. And turns out they get out at Clifton Hill, uh, and I have about another nine stops to get to before I get out at uh, Watsonia. And um, anyway, as they get out, they don't give me a single, they don't look my way at all. They continue the conversation that they're having between them as they get out onto the platform and still continuing conversation as, as the train pulls out. So, when I uh, get to you, of course, you pick me up on the platform and then, uh, you know, we, we greet each other and we're walking up over the bridge to go to the car and, of course, 